So rapamycin has this longevity effect. Can you say a little bit more about the physiological effects it has and any negative consequences that it might induce? Yeah. So again, uh, I mean, one way to think about rapamycin from a biochemical perspective, it's ex extremely clean. Only target we know of is mTOR. And in fact, it's a specific complex. So mTOR, the protein acts in two complexes, mTOR complex one, mTOR complex two. Rapamycin is very specific for mTOR complex one, at least directly. Okay. But mTOR complex one, so we talked about how this is sort of a key node in this network, right? Regulates everything it seems like in the cell. <laughs> so what are the downstream mechanisms by which rapamycin is affecting longevity? There are probably a lot of things you could point to. The big ones that I would point to are, it's a very potent anti-inflammatory. It seems to be relatively specific for the types of chronic, what people call sterile inflammation that accumulate with age. In other words, the immune system reacting to signals it shouldn't be reacting to. Um, so it's a very potent anti-inflammatory. It boosts a process called autophagy, which is, some mm -hmm. people call it the, the cellular recycling center, right? So it's a mechanism by which cells can break down damage or no longer useful macromolecules and reuse their, their building blocks. Uh, it has very potent effects on metabolic function. Um, I, I hesitate to get too far into the details because I'm not sure we really understand exactly how rapamycin is affecting metabolism. It certainly can shift fuel utilization. So, you know, glucose versus fats, and um, it can bypass at least certain types of mitochondrial dysfunction. So we published, you know, this was probably back in 2000, God, 2012, a paper where we showed you could rescue a severe mitochondrial disease in mice with rapamycin. So again, the mechanisms there aren't completely clear, but you can definitely bypass certain types of metabolic dysfunction with rapamycin, at least in a disease state. So it has complicated effects on metabolism, can actually protect mice against diet-induced obesity if you give them enough hmm. rapamycin. Um, and it regulates protein synthesis in, again, very broad and complicated ways and there's data from the invertebrates that these effects of mTOR and rapamycin on protein synthesis are at least partially causal for the longevity benefits. So there are at least four pretty big buckets you can point to where those things might be important for rapamycin's effects on longevity. My thinking on this has shifted quite a bit over the last decade. I think in, in mice and probably to some extent in humans, given that we don't still know how efficacious, efficacious rapamycin is going to be in humans for longevity, is, is at least much of that's mediated through the anti-inflammatory effects, I believe, but not all of it. So like, for example, you can improve heart function in mice, and there's some evidence in dogs and people with rapamycin. That's, I don't know that that's an anti-inflammatory mechanism. I think that's probably more an effect of rapamycin directly in the heart. So it's complicated. Um, so you talked about, do you want me to go on and talk about side effects or do you? you yeah, let's talk about side about effects because that? Yeah, that was going to be my next question is this sounds like all good. Yeah. What, what, why would someone maybe hesitate? To, should, should everyone in middle age be thinking, why not take rapamycin? Well, I don't know the answer to that, that question, but I can tell you why there's hesitation around it, right? So yep. again, first of all, I think, there should be hesitation, right? Again, this gets back to this risk reward. Like, yep. do we know enough about the likelihood of reward and the likelihood of risk and what those look like to make a, a, a calculated decision? Um, so I think the reasons why people would be concerned largely stem from the way rapamycin was developed. So remember I talked about how it was developed clinically as an organ transplant drug, and that was sort of independent of what we were doing over here in the research mm. world. So in that context, rapamycin, has been used extensively in organ transplant patients. It's used at high doses along with strong immunosuppressants. And so in that context, there is a long list of side effects associated with rapamycin. Um, the most common side effect is mouth sores. So in organ transplant patients, these can actually be pretty severe ulcerations of the mouth, which actually cause a lot of people to stop taking the drug and they don't heal. Is that really a, a mouth thing or is it like an epithelial cell thing? probably an epithelial thing. cell thing. Yeah, exactly. So anywhere else that they have effects? Um, you know, I, 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 don't, I don't know how much that has really been looked at. I don't know the okay. answer to that. Okay. I, don't, I don't think it's very prevalent, but potentially in intestine as well, yeah, you yeah. might expect to see, you know, at least a, a loss of an in, in, intestinal barrier 
function? I, it's a good question. I should go look. I don't remember seeing that in the organ transplant literature, but but I, it's possible that it's there. Um, but that is that is the most common side effect in organ transplant patients. Um, obviously, from a like life threatening perspective, that's not a huge concern, but its quality of life can have a big impact. Interestingly, people taking rapamycin off label who aren't organ transplant patients, that's the only side effect that I've seen that's statistically significant. And those are more like canker sores. So yeah. it's not the severe ulcerations. Um, the other things you would worry about, though, and this is the one most people would be worried about, is immune suppression. I mean, that's what it's called. It's called yeah. an immune suppressant, right? So you would be concerned if you were taking an immune, a strong immune suppressant, even if it had a benefit from the biology of aging. Again, it really only takes one severe infection to kill you, yeah. right? Yeah. So you'd be concerned about that. We'll come back to the immune suppressive, if they're real, effects of rapamycin. Um, but that would be the big concern. Uh, the other things people, I think, would be moderately concerned about would be hyperlipidemia. That's not uncommon in some organ transplant patients and um, glucose dysregulation. So there's there's the sort of pseudo-diabetic-like phenotype that can develop in organ transplant patients taking rapamycin. Um, none of those thing, things are really seen in the long-lived mice taking rapamycin, except that they don't develop the pseudo-diabetic phenotype in the sense that the mice don't have higher fasting glucose levels or higher A1C. Interestingly, if you give mice who've been taking rapamycin for many months uh, oral glucose tolerance test, they do show uh, an impaired response on an OGTT. So there's some thought that this, that's why I call it a pseudo-diabetic phenotype because there's some, they don't have true diabetes, but there's some thought that because of rapamycin's effects on metabolic state, that you've kind of shifted the metabolic state of the mice to a, 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 a place where when you then give them a non-physiological bolus of glucose, they don't, aren't able to respond the same way that they would if they had, if they were in a sort of more normal mTOR state. Again, that's kind of sort of hand wavy, mostly because we don't understand the, the, the biochemistry there. Um, okay. So those would be the side effects you'd be worried about. What do we know about side effects in people who are taking rapamycin off-label, meaning their physicians have prescribed it for something other than organ transplant or one of the approved indications. Most, Some of those people are taking it off-label for autoimmune disease. Many of them are taking it off-label because they think it's going to help them from a longevity or health span perspective. Um, so we published a paper last year where we collected data from 333 people using rapamycin off-label, and we compared that to it was about 150 people who'd never used rapamycin. And obviously, there's lots of limitations to that kind of data, lots of caveats. But the things that came out of it that I think were pretty believable and, and looked pretty solid to me was one of the comparisons we did was we asked people in the last three months, have you experienced, and then we had a list of like 44 different things that had been previously associated with rapamycin, side effects, right? Yep. And so we compared people who had been using rapamycin for at least that three-month period to people who'd never used rapamycin. The only thing that was statistically significantly higher in the rapamycin users was mouth sores. That actually was very reassuring because that's exactly what we would expect from the organ transplant literature. So then John Ahn, who's one of the co-authors on this, he's a, a DDS, dentist, PhD, has now gone on and looked more closely at that data. And um, that's where I, I get the result that these are these are more like canker sores, not these ulcers that persist. So, um, so that seems to be pretty mild, but probably real. There were six other things that were statistically different, but they were all lower in the rapamycin group. So is that, are those benefits of rapamycin? Maybe, I don't know. Mm -hmm. But I, I think I'm pretty convinced based on that and based on a lot of the anecdotal you know, data that I'm aware of that the side effects of rapamycin outside of about 15% of people getting canker sores are pretty minimal. Now, again, we don't have a lot of data on people taking rapamycin off-label for many, many years. Yeah. Certainly, you could uncover side effects over that time frame. The one thing that I think, and again, it wasn't statistically significant in our data set, but there was a slight trend. I do believe that it's likely that rapamycin, even off-label use of rapamycin in like, you know, four to 10 mg per week, probably has a slight increase in risk of bacterial infection. Hmm. I also think there's an even stronger benefit in terms of viral infection, that risk of viral infection, or at least severity of viral infection goes down with people taking rapamycin. Hmm. But 
again, that's pretty speculative. So, so I, but I do think there is a slight increased risk of bacterial infection. Mm -hmm. So in animal models, you can use molecular genetics to turn down mTOR. You see longevity boosts. Um, you can use something like rapamycin to pharmacologically turn down mTOR. You see the similar, uh, similar type of effect. What do we know about turning down mTOR in the brain and what that does? Yeah, so um, again, I think degree of inhibition is going to be really important here. So there were actually a lot of concerns, much like in the muscle community, you will hear people concerned that rapamycin would actually induce sarcopenia, which is muscle loss with age. Turns out it's protective, at least in animal models. Hmm. But that's because mTOR is required for muscle growth. Same thing's true in brain. mTOR is required for learning and memory and memory formation. And, it, and people did experiments, you know, 15, 20 years ago showing that if you hit neurons and, and uh, uh, mice with enough rapamycin, you can actually impair learning and memory. Mm -hmm. And that's what you'd expect, right? Because in the brain, even though cells are largely not dividing and there's no growth in that sense, when they strengthen their connections and make new synapses, that's got to turn on mTOR and protein synthesis exactly. and all that. Stuff. Exactly, right. So it's thought to be mostly a protein synthesis mechanism. So if you hit cells with enough rapamycin, you inhibit mTOR enough, you're going to impair synthesis of new proteins. And that's required for lots of stuff, including memory formation, right? So... So there was concern that rapamycin would accelerate dementia or impair learning and memory. Um, there have now been many studies done in uh, aged mice and mouse models of dementia, Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease. And in most cases, you get a protective benefit from rapamycin treatment or genetic inhibition of mTOR in those contexts. And, hmm. and again, many mechanisms have been proposed. Probably the best work in this area uh, was has been done by Veronica Galvin, who was at um, uh, University of Texas San Antonio, is now at University of Oklahoma, where they've done a lot with these hypomorphic genetic constructs, where you can you know control genetically control mTOR expression specifically in the brain, um, and show that you get changes in cerebral vasculature, cerebral blood flow. Um, so. So that's their primary model is that you actually improve cerebral blood flow. There's also pretty good evidence that maybe through autophagy or through other mechanisms, you can reduce, you know, plaques and tangles in the models that develop plaques and tangles. Um, so I think that the bulk of data suggests that at least in the context of aging and at least at the doses of rapamycin that extend lifespan, there is a protective benefit both for brain changes associated with normative aging and in mouse models of these neurodegenerative diseases. Um, I'm trying to think, I'm not aware of any real solid data in people looking at cognitive function in this, the, the sort of off-label uh, rapamycin users, or even in organ transplant patients. I don't think there's any evidence one way or the other in organ transplant patients that I'm aware of. Um, the one thing I will say is that many of the people using rapamycin off-label are using it because they are ApoE4 homozygotes with the hope that it will, you know, reduce their risk of developing dementia because because that's, you know, probably the strongest common genetic risk factor for dementia is being homozygous for ApoE4. How common is off-label use of rapamycin now? And is it reasonable for people in or approaching middle age to think about that? Yeah. So I don't know what the answer is to how common it is other than it's way more common now than it was two years ago or four years ago. Um, there are a growing number of physicians who have become comfortable prescribing rapamycin off-label. Um, but I, you know, in terms of numbers, I... Uh, you know, I've speculated that it's more than 10,000 people in the United States, but I don't know, maybe it's 100,000. I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, there are a lot of people. I'm I'm surprised by how many people tell me that they are using rapamycin off label. <laughs> so these are people that just go into the doctor and they say, I want to get on rapamycin because I think it might have all of these benefits. Usually, yeah. So I mentioned there are, there are a fair number of people who have um, – uh, sort of it, oftentimes sort of independent of even knowing about the longevity literature um, happened on rapamycin through autoimmune or, or chronic immune conditions. So mm. there are a series of case reports in the literature with a variety of different types of autoimmune disease where people have shown pretty dramatic improvements in a subset of patients from rapamycin use. So there's a population of people who have gotten into off-label use of rapamycin that way. But yeah, I think the majority are probably coming from the, the health span longevity perspective. Um, and there are even now a couple of, of 
places, I'm not involved with either, that are, are I think, starting to do telehealth rapamycin. So it makes it easier for people to get it. I think for a long time, people who wanted to try rapamycin had a hard time convincing their physicians that that you know it was safe enough. Because again, most physicians, if they don't know about rapamycin, they're only going to know about it through the organ transplant literature. Yeah. And be like, why would I give you an immune suppressant, right? So there are, it, it, I think people are becoming more comfortable, but still by and large, most physicians are, are not going to be comfortable prescribing it off-label. Mm-hmm. Um, you were involved in some early findings um, from early in your career. Uh, about these things called sirtuins. Mm-hmm. What are the sirtuins and what do they do at a very basic level biologically? Yeah. So sirtuins are a family of what are called NAD dependent protein deacetylases. And so the primary role of sirtuins, there are others that do some other chemical reactions, but just for the sake of simplicity, the primary role of sirtuins are is this deacetylase function where they take acetyl groups off of other proteins. Now, this was so and I first got interested in in sirtuins before sir, the word sirtuin existed because I was studying a protein in yeast called sir2. That's actually where sirtuins come from. Sir2 ends. So sir2 is the founding member of the sirtuin family of proteins. This is a evolutionarily conserved family of proteins. Yeast have, oh God, I should know this, five sirtuins and humans have seven. So, but they're in every organism. Um, So the reason why I got interested in sir2 is sort of has to do with what we were studying in yeast. We knew that the ribosomal DNA was important for aging in yeast. We knew that sir2 was at the ribosomal DNA and also at telomeres, which are important in aging. It was, and for other reasons, it was sort of an obvious thing to test. So I tested whether if we turned up SIR2 activity, we could extend lifespan. It did. That was the first evidence that activating sir could have an effect on longevity. That was part of my PhD thesis result. At that point, though, we didn't know what the function was biochemically. Nobody knew. It was sort of this mystery protein that was important for aging, but nobody knew what its biochemical function was. So another person in the lab, Shin Ichiro Amai, who was a postdoc at the time, was trying to figure out what the biochemical activity of sirtuins was. And he discovered that it had this deacetylase activity. And deacetylases can take acetyl groups off of lots of proteins, but at that time, at least, they were best known for taking acetyl groups off of histones. And that's important because histones sort of pack the DNA and can control which genes get turned on or turned off. Mm -hmm. And deacetylation is a really important mechanism for turning a gene on or turning a gene off, Mm -hmm. right? Because it controls the proteins that pack the DNA. So Shin found that it was not only a deacetylase, but it was this NAD-dependent deacetylase. Mm. And that, that is the first time that biochemical activity, that was sort of a new enzymatic activity showing that it coupled NAD to histone deacetylation. So it was a big deal at that point. And that also, because NAD is involved in central metabolism, linked central metabolism to gene expression. So this was this was a link between how a cell is metabolizing and which genes it's going to then turn on and off. Yeah, and longevity, because we have this other longevity piece over here. Yeah, so it was really interesting and exciting and sort of catalyzed this whole area of research around sirtuins. Now, I think from the longevity side, kind of like I was talking about with Tor earlier, you know, people thought it was kind of cool that this worked in yeast, but it was yeast, like. Come on, what does that mean? Then a postdoc in the lab, Heidi Tissenbaum at the time, uh, showed that if you overexpress the worm version of SIR2, you also extend lifespan in C. elegans. And then Steve Helfand's lab showed that if you overexpress the fly version of SIR2, you extend lifespan in flies. So that, again, led to this evolutionarily conserved function for sir as longevity factors, or at least that model became popularized. Um, so then now, you know, Lots and lots of people started studying sirtuins. They tried to find longevity benefits for all the seven sirtuins in humans. And and throughout this whole, you know, this was, it was 1999 when we published our first sirtu yeast paper. So in the 25 years since then, God, um, uh, lots of people have tried really, 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 really hard to find important roles for sirtuins in aging. The mouse, but sorry, the worm and fly stuff has been a little bit controversial. It's not completely clear to me that sirtuins are potent regulators of longevity, even in worms and flies, certainly not clear in mammals. And so it's sort of led to this, it's an interesting phenomenon where 
all of this momentum got built up and all of this, um, you know, it was people's careers depended on this model being right, that, you know, a lot of effort went into to proving the hypothesis that sirtuins were this really important longevity regulators. And it just really hasn't panned out. I'm not saying that they aren't involved. They're in that network. Mm -hmm. I just don't think that they're particularly good nodes for tweaking the network in a way that increases longevity. And so really the only evidence in mammals right now that sirtuins might have a relatively robust effect on longevity comes from a specific sirtuin called SIRT6. And even that really hasn't been replicated outside of a single lab. So I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm just saying I've been in this field long enough and I've seen a lot of shiny objects that I don't get too excited until I see, you know, multiple labs replicate the same finding and you want to see it genetically and you want to see it pharmacologically and you want to understand the mechanism. So I'm still kind of on the fence about sirtuins as a viable target for, you know, longevity or health span yeah. benefits. So, so are you basically saying that a lot of the hype around sirtuins come from some of those early findings that you and others were involved in, but a lot of that stuff just hasn't been replicated and panned out in the way we thought it would? Yeah, I mean, the yeast the yeast stuff has been replicated. So that I'm rock, and I did that work. Obviously, I'm biased too. <laughs> other people have replicated it, yeah, right? Yeah. So I'm confident about that result, at least in the strain backgrounds we were working in. Again, there's, you know, and this is something a lot of people don't understand. Oftentimes in these laboratory studies, you know, you work in a specific genetic background. Yeah, yeah. And oftentimes the findings in that genetic background are not tested in a variety of other genetic backgrounds. Yep. And sometimes you get different results in different yep. genetic backgrounds. In fact, I would say that's more common. That's mm -hmm. more the rule than the exception. Yeah. I mean, you mentioned earlier, you know. Polaric restriction. Exactly. Yeah. Different genetic backgrounds yeah. can get the opposite effect. Yeah. So, so. But, I, but I'm confident that the yeast stuff is rock solid. And I think the fly-in worm stuff, I'm not saying it's wrong, but I think the effects are relatively small and probably context dependent. So there's aspects of the environment or the experimental setup that influence, like maybe the temperature, for example, that influence whether you see a lifespan benefit. And when you're talking about a small effect that's also sensitive to environment, that leads to challenges in, in replicability. And so that's why I have you know, really tried hard in my career to study things that are robust and that work every time. Because I think when you get in this gray area of really trying to study small effects, it just gets really hard. And you're very prone to getting misled and going down a path that ultimately is not productive. Well, I, I want to have a general discussion about um, supplementation and things like that. One of the, but I also want to tie it into this sirtuin stuff and what's known and unknown yeah. about the biology under the hood. You know, there's a lot of hype around, um, I believe it's called NMN. That's yeah. a popular supplement. Nicotinamid mononucleotide. Yeah. How does that tie into this? Yeah. What's hype and what's real? So so the way it ties in is, I mentioned sirtuins are NAD-dependent deacetylases. So nicotinamid mononucleotide, nicotinamid riboside are the two sort of shiny object NAD precursors, right, that, um, that can, in theory, boost NAD levels. Niacin can do the same thing. That's just not very exciting because we've known about it for, you know, decades. Um, so these are all things that are in the same metabolic biosynthesis pathway for NAD. In other words, if you take enough of them and you are deficient for NAD, you can NAD. get converted into NAD, at least theoretically. Mm -hmm. and, and NAD goes down with age in general. That is the model that has been put out there. I see. Oh. <laughs> um, so again, this is where and I mean, unfortunately, this is just the reality of I don't think this is unique to the longevity field. I see it most in the longevity field where, you know, there are individuals who publish high profile papers who have a very vested interest in a particular model. And then they publish high profile reviews where they talk about these things as if they are established fact. But they're basically talking about their own work. Yes. Which is one piece of the greater That's body right. of literature. And often, you know, even though it's published, I still think of it, like I said, as kind of preliminary until multiple people have seen the same thing. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. And so, I mean, just for those who are listening, you know, when oftentimes when you read a review paper, the reviews are sort of meant to be someone that has been in a field and they are summarizing the full body of yeah. literature about something. But sometimes that gets a little abused. Historically, that's what, that's what reviews were supposed to be. And again, you know, maybe I'm being a little bit 
maybe I'm getting a little jaded or something, but I feel like over time that mod, you, those are less and less you see those kinds of reviews. Yeah. What you see now more are perspective reviews. It's the person's perspective, which is fine yeah. if it's labeled as a perspective, but it's labeled as a comprehensive review of my own work, right? Yeah. Which is often what these yeah. things become. Yeah, and like, you know, as, as a grad student or even just someone interested in science, you often go to a review thinking, yeah. this is like the, yeah. the objective view of this whole yeah. body of work rather than someone's perspective. Yeah, exactly. So I think this idea that NAD levels generally decline with age um, is overstated. So I think what's clear is that at least in certain tissues in mice, NAD sometimes declines with age. <laughs> in people, there's very little evidence to support this. And in fact, there was a pretty- But it's been looked at. Oh yeah, there was a pretty decent comprehensive review written. I was probably late 2022, and I don't remember the exact phrasing, but the but the phrasing basically was that this is overstated. That it it might be the case that NAD generally declines with age, but there's really very little evidence to support that. So I think we don't know. But yes, the conceptually, if NAD levels broadly declined with age, then boosting NAD levels might have benefits in that context. So that's one piece, but then there's also this sirtuin piece, and that's how the NAD precursors first started being studied. So this now we're going to go back, you know, to 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 when I was a graduate student or slightly after that. Um, so after after I had shown that if you overexpress sirtuin, you could extend lifespan. There was a lot of interest in understanding that. It's a sort of a different story, but sirtuins got linked to caloric restriction. Again, that model has, I think, largely been disproven, but there for a while was this model that caloric restriction was increasing lifespan by activating sirtuins, and that was mediated through this NAD mechanism. So caloric restriction increases NAD, activates sirtuins. So then people started studying these NAD precursors as a way to activate sirtuins, believing at that time that activating sirtuins would increase lifespan and mm -hmm. improve health span. It turns out NAD is involved in a lot of other things in the cell that don't involve sirtuins, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like yeah. central metabolism <laughs> and DNA damage repair and a bunch of other stuff. So I think the idea that if the NAD precursors have any benefits, that those benefits are mediated by sirtuins is pretty speculative. Um, and then there's still this piece of do NAD precursors, generally speaking, have benefits? I don't know the answer to that. My speculation is there are going to be a subset of people who have certain types of metabolic dysfunction where NAD homeostasis is perturbed. And in those people, yeah, NAD mm -hmm. precursors probably will have a benefit. And there's some evidence in mitochondrial disease models for that. Broadly speaking, for aging, I'm not convinced. Mm -hmm. Could be true, but it, it also might have a negligible effect. Yeah, and there's other work that's suggested that, you know, these NAD precursors, which are, you know, pretty expensive relative to, you know, niacin, um, uh, all get broken down in the gut to the, to the same precursors mm -hmm. anyways, by the gut so, microbiome. So. so why would someone buy an NMN supplement rather than niacin? Well, I mean, I think that there is there are the, the side effects of niacin, right? Like flushing, right? That some people experience that can be unpleasant. So that might be one reason. Um, also because that's what the influencers are telling them to do. I see. So with respect <laughs> to NAD though, niacin will do the same thing. Yes. Okay. Um, I want to ask you about resveratrol. Um, I, think yeah. you, I think you can imagine why. Let's just start very simple. What is it and how did it first come to be associated with the aging yeah. stuff? Yeah, I mean, resveratrol, resveratrol is a drug that's been, or a, it, is a, it is a small molecule that's been around for, you know, many, many decades, right? And people have studied it. It's a natural product, polyphenol. It's found in, you know, grapes and other plants. Um, you know, the thought is that some of these polyphenols are produced as, uh, stress response in the plants or, or uh, mechanisms to, you know, fend off uh, other animals that might eat the plants. But any, in any case, these things are produced. There's a whole family of polyphenols, obviously, that people are excited about. Resveratrol first became of interest in the um, longevity field from a study that was published out of David Sinclair's lab in 2003 where what they were doing, I mean, it's a pretty smart idea. What they were doing was looking for small molecule activators of sirtuins, and mm -hmm. they looked at the yeast sirtu. Thinking thinking in the way that you described earlier, if we can find a way to turn on sirtu, it, it will have this longevity benefit. Absolutely. If you believe that sir, sirtuin activation is a general longevity intervention, then we did that genetically in yeast. If you found a small molecule that did it, 
you should be able to get the longevity benefit. And so they created this, what's called in vitro assay, so in the test tube, for screening large numbers of small molecules to find things that could activate SIR2 and SIR T1, the human uh, version of SIR2, in a test tube. And they found resveratrol and quercetin and, I don't know, five or six other things with the similar sort of polyphenol structure. And so then they published that they could activate SIR2 in the test tube with these molecules and that they could activate SIR2 in yeast cells with these molecules using a couple of different readouts of SIR2 activity. So remember I mentioned that SIR2 is an NAD-dependent histone deacetylase. When you activate SIR2, what you do is you turn down gene expression at the places in the genome where SIR2 has this activity. Mm -hmm. So they had markers at these places in the genome that they could see were being turned up mm -hmm. or turned down. So they published that resveratrol increased silencing, turned down gene expression through a SIR2-dependent mechanism, and that it extended lifespan in yeast. So that was the original paper. And then, again, it was in yeast. It got published in Nature, but I don't know how many people really paid a lot of attention to it. But then they went in a couple of years later, published that you could put resveratrol in the chow of mice fed a high-fat diet and prevent the diet-induced obesity and increase the survival of those mice. And that led to, you know, the whole, and because resveratrol is in grapes, it's high in red wine, people got very excited. Yep. You can just consume. That you could drink red wine and live longer, right? Yep. And I get yep. it. It's a great story. I wish it was true. Um, uh, so that's how it got introduced into the field. Okay, so so just to summarize so far before we dissect this further, there was this idea that turning up SIR2 had a longevity benefit. The idea, because people did that through... Uh, experimental models using genetics, if you could find a small molecule that does that and that does in fact provide longevity benefit in humans, th that's sort of like the holy grail. Yeah. Now people can consume the small molecule and they'll get this longevity benefit. That's what we're aiming for. Right. So the original yeast result with resveratrol, resveratrol, do you have confidence that, that <laughs> holds true? I have confidence that it does not hold true. <laughs> uh, so, I mean, to, to put this in context, the reason why I have confidence is because we tried and tried and tried and tried to reproduce it. But the reason why we tried to reproduce that had nothing to do with resveratrol. So this was work that I was doing as a postdoc um, along with Brian Kennedy at the time, where I, I, I alluded to the idea that there was this hypothesis at the time that caloric restriction was acting through SIR2, mm -hmm. right? That it, caloric restriction activated SIR2 and that's how it was extending lifespan. So Brian and I had actually come up with genetic evidence that caloric restriction and SIR2 were acting in different pathways. We could show that you did not need SIR2 to get lifespan extension from caloric restriction, and we could combine them and get additive effects. So it was mapping to two pathways. And we thought, we David had published this really cool resveratrol result where we had now a drug that we could pharmacologically mimic the genetic overexpression of SIR2. So we, and I mean, you, you probably get this. I don't know if everybody watching this understands that when you're doing experiments, you like to do the same experiment multiple different ways yes. and make sure you get the same answer, right? And so we thought we could do it genetically, but we also have this drug. We could do it pharmacologically and, and test our model using a drug and see if we get the same answer. So we tried resveratrol and we couldn't get it to work. And we tried again and we couldn't get it to work. And we tried again and we couldn't get it to work. And we called David and said, we can't get it to work. What did you guys do? And so he he kept giving us different lists of things to try. <laughs> we tried them all. I We must have done this experiment 30 times. Like, mm -hmm. I mean, it was a massive amount of my time that I spent doing this. <laughs> I mean, I'm not joking. Like literally these lifespan experiments, I must have done it 30 times. I bet if I go look in our database, we've got 60, 70 experiments by now. Anyways, um, we never got it to extend lifespan. And then, we st and then at some point we gave up. We were like, okay, we've tried everything. We don't actually think this is extending lifespan, but they showed that you could put it on yeast cells and activate SIR2. Mm -hmm. So what, what's going on here? So maybe maybe there's something about our cells. Let's put it on the yeast cells and see if we're activating SIR2. And we couldn't get it to activate SIR2 in the cells. So then we thought maybe it has something to do with this test tube assay. And so then we started talking to 
uh, a group at the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center, Tony so Bedelock. You were trying to replicate the result in your own little experimental setting. And yeah. now I think you're about to tell me you went to try and rep- – you're now going to look at the specific experiment they did and look for a difference well, in Well, we conditions? did the same experiment they did in yeast. Okay. We couldn't replicate that. Oh, okay. It was the exact same experiment. Exact same experiment. We, we actually – well, at first we were in a different strain background and then we – got the same strain background. So we, yes, we did as close as we possibly could. Okay. We even suggested like, I would go to Harvard and do it there, or they could send somebody here and do it here. David didn't want to do that for whatever reason. So we tried as hard as we could to get it to work and tried to replicate their conditions as much as we possibly could. And here's the thing. They reported a huge effect. They reported like a 70% effect on lifespan. That is- That's massive. That's huge in this experimental system, right? So- I mean, I really feel like we yep. did as much as we possibly yeah. could. You should have at least seen some effect, even if it wasn't 70%. I if- think we did everything we legitimately could to, to replicate mm-hmm. that. I, I feel pretty good about that. So so we started thinking, though, maybe it has something to do with this test tube assay, because we could get the test tube assay to work. Okay. So you could actually get the same kit that they use, the same substrate. By that point, the company had actually commercialized the kit, so it was a research tool that was available. We could see resveratrol activate SIR2 in the test tube, just not in the cells. Mm. And so then we went and we were talking with um, Tony Bedelov at the Hutch and, an, and another group at the time, and they both had sort of independently come to the conclusion that the specific substrate used in this in vitro tube was different structurally than a typical protein. It had a fluorescent group. So, the, so this is maybe worth spending 30 seconds on. What, what, the, what, what David's collaborators had done was create a, a peptide that looked like a histone. Remember, sirtuins are NAD-dependent histone deacetylases. So it looked like a histone. But then they put a fluorescent group on the end of it, which is not mm. biological. So it wasn't the native histone. It was a modified version of that histone. And it was a short peptide. So it wasn't the whole histone. It was just a short short piece of it with this fluorescent group. And what that fluorescent group allowed them to do was do the high-throughput assay because you could see light, right? So you could see how fast this deacetylation reaction was happening. So it's very smart, very smart setup in the test tube. It turns out, though, that that fluorescent group allowed resveratrol structurally to change the conformation, and I don't know, I don't even know if we know, like as a, as a community, whether it changes the conformation of the st- substrate, the peptide, or the sirtuin, but it changes the conformation in a way that allowed the sirtuin to have better access to the acetyl group and deacetylate it. So resveratrol was activating things in that context. It was an experimental artifact. So it's basically what I think like. we were very generous in the title of our paper, which was substrate specific activation <laughs> of sirtuins by resveratrol. So it activated specifically for this substrate. Might there be proteins in cells that have that same structural feature or something like it? Maybe we couldn't rule that out. What we could, I feel, rule out is that resveratrol did not extend lifespan in yeast and does not appear to activate sirtuin in yeast. So I feel confident about that. And I feel confident saying that. I'm not going to blast the rest of the resveratrol literature, but I'm pretty sure that that yeast result is not real. So when people think about resveratrol and they have this association with the longevity stuff, the idea is you consume resveratrol, it's going to have a longevity benefit. Taking that in a couple parts. So first of all, um, is res- if you consume something like a food or red wine or whatever with resveratrol in it or a supplement, you're ch- specifically yeah. ingesting resveratrol, how much of that is actually going to get in your body and be yeah, absorbed? I, I, I'm, I, I haven't really followed that closely. My impression is that, that the consensus seems to be that resveratrol has very low bioavailability. And so it would take a lot to get enough resveratrol in circulation to achieve the same doses that have been associated with health benefits in mice. Mm -hmm. I also think it's worth saying, though, that nobody should take resveratrol thinking it's a longevity drug. Resveratrol is the most debunked longevity drug out there. There was a meta-analysis done, I think in 2023, where they tried to look at essentially all of the published lifespan studies with resveratrol in any organism yeast, worms, flies, mice, the median result was zero. And that includes worm experiments. So resveratrol does extend lifespan in C. elegans. The median result, including the worm experiments, was zero. Hmm. You take the worm experiments out, it's less than zero. I see. Okay. (laughs) So, and that's 
I don't know how many were in there, more than two dozen, probably even a lot more than that. So this has been tested a lot and it's pretty so clear. So there's no evidence that resveratrol has a longevity benefit in vertebrates at all? In fact, I would say it even stronger than that. There's evidence that resveratrol does not have longevity benefits. Hmm. I think when you do this sort of meta-analysis where you're getting up to very large numbers, so this is one of the challenges, right? It's when somebody publishes that something has an effect, it's really hard to disprove that because there's all sorts of differences of conditions, blah, blah, blah. And I'm going to believe that. When I say blah, 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 I'm not trying to be dismissive. It is true. The conditions matter, right, right? right? But I feel like when you start getting up into the dozens of people trying to replicate these experiments and the net result is zero, that's pretty convincing that the real result is probably zero. Mm -hmm. Tori. Now, I, I, let, me, let me just make an additional comment on that, though because this is where people get all bent out of shape. I'm not saying that resveratrol doesn't have any health benefits. There are lots of studies out there in disease models in mice, maybe in diet-induced obesity in mice, where there are, are there's evidence that resveratrol can have effects in that context. Mm -hmm. So that's important and should be studied further. I'm not convinced, though, because of the bioavailability issues that, that you can convincingly get those levels mm -hmm. in people. Actually, before I move on, I, I do have a question. So you mentioned the initial result with resveratrol from David Sinclair's lab. We just went through all of, all of the, the stuff there around the inability that others had of replicating that result. The mouse experiment they did for diet-induced obesity in overweight mice, yeah. why was that the experiment that was done? Naively, I would think that you just take sort of regular lab mice and see if there's a longevity benefit <laughs> in a regular mouse. You, you would think so, huh? <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> so, I, I mean, I, I, I suspect that they did both and they published the one that works. Got it. And that's and not in fact, uncommon. In fact, that's... yeah, it's not uncommon. And in fact... The interventions testing program, so we talked about rapamycin, extended lifespan in the interventions testing program. Resveratrol did not extend lifespan in the interventions testing program. So I think it's, and other people have reported this as well. Resveratrol probably does not increase lifespan in mice that are normally aging. It might in mice fed this, you know, weird high, it wasn't even a normal high fat diet. It was this weird coconut oil diet. So. Okay. Interesting. It was, uh... yeah. I mean, I've heard Rich Miller talk about it. He's, he's got very, uh, he's, he's, hilarious. He has a very strong wit, but um, he talks about the diet. I don't remember the words he uses, but it it actually causes the mite. They just, I think they develop so much fat around their organs, they end up suffocating. Oh, wow. And I don't know how resveratrol protects against it's, that. Yeah, okay, so it's not even the normal high fat diet. Right. It's some weird diet. Right. Interesting. Okay. Um, I want to move on. So another molecule that people get really excited about with respect to longevity is taurine. Yeah. Um, you can buy it by the kilogram. <laughs> it's cheap and easy to consume. Um, apparently, across species, uh, you observe a decrease in taurine I, again, with age. Again, we got to be okay. a little bit careful. Okay. So, yeah, I mean, I think so. And I was a co-author on that, that taurine paper that was published in Science. So I had very little to do with it. Uh, we did some of the worm uh, and yeast experiments, but uh, but I was a co-author just for full disclosure. Okay. Can you summarize um, that basic result and then Yeah, so this it? is work of Vijay Yadav. He's the the, the lead author. Um, really, uh, yeah, I mean, that was a lot of work they put into this study. So the 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 summary is that at least in worms, flies, and mice, you can get increased lifespan by supplementing with taurine. And in primates, there's some evidence for health span benefits. So they even had some primate studies in there. And you, you can at least find evidence in all of those organisms that taurine levels decrease with age. I want to be a little bit careful not to suggest that that's going to be, and even in people, there's some evidence that taurine levels decrease with age. But I want to be a little bit careful to not suggest that that's going to be true in every population, every genetic background. And and I, I, I don't know if it's been published yet, but I have seen data in people from other populations that did not see a decrease in taurine. So I'm not sure how universal it is that taurine levels decline with age in people or even in, in dogs. There's some evidence that it does, but I don't know how, how generalizable that's going to be. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, do you believe that basic result, though, that when they, uh, the, the results around supplementation, you give exogenous taurine to different animals and it extends lifespan? I do. I do believe it. I think, again, you know, I've seen enough mouse experiments that work in one genetic background and not in another that I still... I you know, it's a really solid paper. I mean, it's a lot more work that's in mm -hmm. than is in most papers, but it's still the first report. And so even though I'm a co-author, 
I want to see it replicated right, and right. optimally replicated in other genetic backgrounds. So hopefully the interventions testing program will test it. I think if I saw, so, and this is again, probably worth mentioning because yeah, ITP has come up a couple of times. The interventions testing program uses a uh, mouse strain background called UMHET3, which is actually a four-way cross of four different strain backgrounds. So it's genetically heterogeneous. Each individual is different from every other individual. The taurine work, I believe, was all in C57 black six. Mm -hmm. So that's a standard inbred yeah. mouse strain. Yeah, and that's maybe important to mention for listeners is when we when we do experiments in animals, they're often in inbred strains yes. that are very homogenous genetically. That's right. Yeah, no, that's exactly right. And so uh, it, it's, and, and I mean, many people will argue that the ITP genetic background is superior for the reason that it is genetically heterogeneous. I think that's valid. I don't know that I've seen enough to convince me that black six isn't as good of a background, but from a genetic perspective, genetically heterogeneous is going to be closer to people for sure. Uh, metformin. What is that drug and how does that fit into the longevity issues? Yeah. So metformin is the most widely prescribed anti-diabetic drug in the world. Um, its, mechanism, it's a, its mechanism of action is complicated. It has many targets. But I think the one that is most commonly thought to mediate the anti-diabetic effects is it's an activator of a protein called AMP kinase, which I alluded to earlier. Also in this longevity network, AMP kinase interacts with TOR. Um, AMP kinase is a cent central metabolic sensor. So most people think of it as an energy sensor. So when there's lots of ATP, the energy currency of the cell, right, that tends to lead to decreased AMP kinase signaling when there's not enough AMP ATP, AMP kinase gets activated and that boosts metabolism. So there's, I think, a body of literature showing that activation of AMP kinase genetically, at least in invertebrates, can increase lifespan. Um, and metformin became of interest, I think primarily because there were some early mouse studies by a guy named Anisimov where they were using a short-lived cancer-prone strain of mice. So, you know, C57 black six will have a median, the controls should live to about 850 to 900 days in a good experiment. In fact, this is a cautionary tale. If you see somebody do a lifespan experiment in C57 black six and the controls are 600 days, run away. Like do not even read that paper because it's not interpretable in my view. They should be about 850, 900 days. Anisimov is using a strain, I don't remember exactly what it was, but it was less than 600. So short-lived, cancer-prone strain. And there they showed that metformin could increase lifespan. And so people became excited by the idea that this anti-diabetes drug that was very safe, very widely used in people, activated AMP kinase, might be a good longevity drug. And so then people started looking in the human literature and noticed that diabetics taking metformin were at lower risk for a bunch of different age-related diseases than diabetics not taking metformin. And so that was kind of consistent, but of course that could just be because you're improving their diabetes. And I think what really got people excited was a study several years ago now reporting that in one particular population, if you look at all-cause mortality, diabetics taking metformin had much lower all-cause mortality than diabetics not taking metformin, but even a little bit lower all-cause mortality than non-diabetics not taking metformin. That's really exciting if real. It turns out that hasn't been replicated since then and, and people have tried. So I actually don't think that result is real, but this has led to a lot of enthusiasm around the idea that metformin is this cheap, relatively safe, widely used drug that in people could be tested for benefits for age-related diseases and longevity. So now let's go back to the mice for a minute. Um, it turns out that people have studied metformin now in longer-lived strains. And <clears throat> the interventions testing program clearly showed no effect from metformin on lifespan in the genetically heterogeneous mice. There was one study from Rafa DeCabo's lab in C57 black six mice that I think was I think the title here was very unfortunate because the title said something about, you know, metformin improves lifespan and health span in mice. When you look at the data, they tested two doses of metformin. At the low dose, metformin increased lifespan by, I want to say, 4%. It's a tiny, tiny lifespan effect. I don't know if I believe it. But at the other dose, it shortened lifespan by 10%. Hmm. The so, higher dose. Yeah. So the conclusion that metformin increases lifespan seems a bit selective to me when it, it actually shortened lifespan by a lot more at the other dose, but regardless. 
Um, I think the data, I think most people have settled on the consensus that metformin probably doesn't increase lifespan, at least in longer lived mouse strains. Or if it does, it's a very, very small effect. So the question is, you know, given that, how excited should we be about metformin as a potential longevity drug in people? My feeling is that, again, metformin does affect AMP kinase. AMP kinase is in this network. Again, I'm not convinced that metformin is a great tool, though, for perturbing this network in a way that is consistent with slower biological aging or increased longevity. We'll have to see, because people, I think, are going forward with the, I don't know if you've heard of the TAME trial, targeting aging with metformin. It's a large clinical trial in people. I mean, I hope it works, but it would not be my first choice if I was trying to pick the best options. It'd be like 10 or 12 on the list given what we know from the animal studies and what we know from the human epidemiology. The other thing I think that's probably worth mentioning is I also think that people tend to, much like I personally believe people tend to overestimate the side effects from rapamycin, I think people tend to underestimate the side effects associated with metformin. I think metformin is a safe drug in the context of diabetics, right? Because you get a lot more benefit from fixing your diabetes than the potential side effects you get from metformin. But the concerns with metformin, there, and there are a few um, outside of the sort of gastrointestinal stuff that some people experience, the things I'd be concerned about are lower testosterone. I don't know what fraction of men that happens in, but it happens in a significant fraction of men. And the accumulating sort of evidence that metformin might offset the molecular beneficial effects of exercise. Mm. And again, I'm not saying that's a rock solid because that data is still pretty early, but there has been more than one study now in both animal models and in people suggesting that at least some of the metabolic changes that are thought to be beneficial in the context of exercises are attenuated by metformin. So I'd be a little bit concerned about that. I think if you're a diabetic and your doc prescribes metformin, take your metformin. If you're not a diabetic, personally, I wouldn't take metformin off-label for potential longevity benefits. You know, based not only on how I know science actually works in practice, based also on how hot the aging field is, right? Everyone, everyone literally in the world wants to figure out how to age more gracefully. Um, no one really wants to die for the most part. We want to be as healthy for as long as possible, obviously. Yeah. So obviously this is going to be a hot field. Um, there's a lot of venture capital pumping into companies that are working on anti-aging stuff. There's a lot of grant money that goes to researchers to study the stuff because it's, it's of such wide interest. Do you worry that the field is being contaminated and that there's a lot of sloppy science being done? <laughs> so – uh, uh, let me comment on that in a minute. I want to I want to comment though on this idea that there's a lot of money being pumped in the into the field because there's actually not compared to in the in the research yeah, side yeah. compared to cancer, heart disease. You know, if you look just at NIA or NIH, one half of one percent of the NIH budget goes to biology of aging. Hmm. It's a tiny fraction, especially given that biology of aging is the greatest risk factor for almost every major cause of death and disability. In Can you give us a comparison countries. point there? Like how much goes to cancer or something yeah. like that? So about 350 million goes to biology of aging, about 6 billion goes to cancer. Hmm. That's just NIH, not DOD where it's probably even skewing things worse. So, um, so biology of aging is really relatively underfunded hmm. given the potential benefits for health, right? From keeping people healthy, instead of keeping people sick, which is most of what we do with the disease-focused mechanism. Cancer is a little bit different because you can cure people's cancers. You really can't cure most other diseases. Um, so in any case, I just want to, I, I don't want to, while more money has has come into the field from other sources, yep. you know, you hear about the billionaires wanting to live forever, all of that. Uh, Evolution Foundation is, is they say they're going to put a billion dollars a year into the field, which would be great. It would triple the total NIH funding for the field. But compared to cancer, that's still a fraction, right? So it's 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 relatively small compared so to yeah, other it's not, areas. It's not as much as you might think. Right. Okay. Certainly not given the importance, I would say, yeah, of the problem yeah. or the potential benefits. Okay. So having said that, am I worried about the field being contaminated? You know, I have kind of two feelings about this. I've been in the field long enough that I can tell you the field was contaminated 
the whole time. So <laughs> I think the line has shifted much like it has in the rest of society about, you know, what is the fringe and what is, you know, commonplace. I think, unfortunately, in my view, unfortunately, you know, some of the rhetoric, some of the behavior that I don't feel comfortable with has become normalized. I don't know how much of that is our field because the field's growing because there's a lot of attention and how much of that is just because society's kind of become that way. I mean, look at our politics for Christ's right, sake. Right. You know, <laughs> so, um, so yeah, I'm concerned that some of the uh, poor use of language will turn off serious people. Uh, I'm concerned that, you know, some of the marketing of products that don't work is going to give the field a black eye. Um, that has happened in the past where, you know, I think it's clear the field has been set back by things like that in the past. So yeah, I, I'm concerned about it. I don't know that there's anything that can be done about it. Yeah. Um, and I don't, you know, I don't think anybody in the field scientific on the science side wants to like play policeman and call all that stuff out. I mean, I've sort of done that in egregious cases, but that's no fun. Like right, I, I don't right. want to be the guy that is always, you know, you shouldn't talk like that. You know what I mean? Right, right. So I don't know what to do about it. But, yeah, yeah. Um, well, so, so in terms of a lot of the major results that are out there or the ideas that are being promoted, what are some of the big ideas that have gotten a lot of attention that you think people should be especially skeptical about for now? Yeah. Well, I would say supplements in general. So yeah. anybody who claims that they have a longevity or anti-aging supplement, you have to be skeptical of. Doesn't mean there's no data to support it, but there's certainly no evidence in people for any of these things being longevity drugs. Um, so I think there you have to then look at the animal studies and, and you kind of have to, again, try to do the best risk reward analysis you can. Um, but I would also put under the risk category, how much does it cost? <laughs> that For some people that doesn't matter, but for a lot of people, if you're spending a couple hundred bucks on supplements, you could spend that couple hundred bucks on a gym membership and get something you know much more likely to benefit your health or good quality food. So I think that should weigh in. Um, so I think supplements in general, just be very skeptical of. I personally you know, would say stay away from resveratrol. I'm not a big fan of NAD pre precursors. We already talked about why. Um, so, so that that's one area I would I would I would point to. Um, I think other than the supplements, the other area that I think a lot of people are are maybe misled by are these biological aging tests that are going direct to consumer. Yeah, I was going to ask you about those. Yeah, so I mean, I feel like the the the, the science there is real, right? In the sense that. You know, one flavor, the most common flavor of biological aging tests are these epigenetic tests. So they're measuring changes in methylation with age of DNA. That's the epigenetic marks they're measuring. And people have shown in mice and people and dogs, there are characteristic changes in methylation with age that correlate with chronological age. And you can find people who are off of that correlation yeah. linear equation and they are People Less who are more likely, biologically older or younger yeah, than right. their calendar. Epigenetically age. older or younger, yeah. And they are, and then those people with some degree of correlation are more or less likely to die, right, mm -hmm. in the next five years or 10 years. So there's some relationship between these epigenetic signatures and mortality mm -hmm. risk and maybe health risk for different diseases. And that works in a research setting. I think there's two questions about the commercially available epigenetic tests. One is, how do we know these companies are actually doing it right? Like, what's the error? What's the precision of, if you took the same sample, did it three times, would you get the same result? Like, we don't, we have no information on that. We kind of have to trust these companies are doing it right. I don't know about you, I don't trust any of these companies. So, and I know some of the people at these companies, some of them are good people, some of them aren't, some of them are. But I don't trust that they're doing it right until I see the data. Mm -hmm. So I don't know whether these tests are actually working the way that we think yeah. they're working. Even if they're doing it right, like if you if you run the experiment, if you do the measurement twice, there's going to be some intrinsic yeah. error that's level. Right. That's and right. we have no idea what that's that right. is. So that's one piece. Then the other piece is we don't actually know what these tests are telling us in terms of biological age, health risks. So all of that is based on correlative studies from long-term longitudinal data in people. So maybe this is worth talking through exactly how these, these relationships have been made. So in these long-term longitudinal studies, people have collected, let's say, blood samples from individuals over a couple of decades. Yep. And what scientists have done is look at the blood samples from 10 years ago and five years ago and, and now, 
and measure these epigenetic signatures. And you can do this with other types of data. You can do it with proteins, you can do it with metabolites. So these epigenetics, you can build clocks off of just about any sufficiently dimensional data set. So they, they built these epigenetic clocks off of, say, people, their blood samples from 20 years ago. Yep. They correlate it with the chronological age of the person at that time, okay? And then they can do different correlations and say, well, let's look at the people who died in the next 10 years. So who's still alive? And can we build epigenetic patterns that are reflecting mortality risk? And of course, you can do it. If your data is sufficiently high dimensional, you can create a subset of features that are going to be strongly associated with whatever you want to associate. Right, with. right. And so I think you can make a case that in that population, there is an association between these epigenetic patterns and five-year mortality risk or 10-year mortality risk or kidney disease. Mm -hmm. whatever, whatever feature you have enough people over this 20 years, they've developed it that you've got the statistical power to build these clocks. So does that prove that if you now get a blood test, that that same pattern is going to predict your risk of dying in the next 10 years. Not only might I be in a different population of people defined however we want to define that, but also we're in a very different context. I think that's exactly that's exactly like the important people point. People are less healthy by yeah. many measures if today you, than they were. If you think about what the world was like 20 years ago or 30 years ago, even just the diabetes, or not di well, diabetes, but obesity risk, yeah. right? Yeah. So the environment is quite different. And so it's possible that these tests are telling you about biological age as a whatever that true measure of biological age is it's possible these tests are telling you about that i don't think they are it's possible they're telling you about your sort of overall health status i think that's plausible it's possible it's telling you about what your overall health status would be 20 years ago hmm. that's also possible right so, yeah it's almost <laughs> like they're doing a comparison of you to that population from then yeah that's yeah. exactly what it is so i think that's why it's worth being a little bit a little bit skeptical, even if you believe that the companies are doing everything right, the test is 100% precise, it's not clear to me that the result is actionable and that you should change what you're doing based only on that test. I would put a lot more faith in functional measurements of strength, body composition, you know, blood metabolites that we know because of decades of clinical research are predictive of health risk than I would put in an epigenetic test, especially if the epigenetic test is giving you a different answer from those things. Yeah, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. In terms of things like blood markers, so there's also a lot of products out there now that allow people to do, uh, get, you know, take blood samples at home yeah. so they don't have to go into the doctor to get it, yeah. to get, you know, dozens of markers in some cases. In terms of like the basic blood markers that you would get for like a routine uh, checkup, yeah. um, what are, what are the ones that stick out the most to you as being important to look at from a longevity perspective? So I think there's two ways I'll answer that. One is, I mean, I think the, the blood markers you get in, most people will get from their typical primary care sort of system. I mean, the ones that are probably going to be most important for most people are going to be around metabolic and lipids. So glucose homeostasis and, and lipids because of heart disease, right? Glucose for diabetes. Um, but having said that, I think that the basic blood work that most people get is woefully inadequate for what we should be doing, right? So like just there's some very, very simple low-hanging fruit here that every, everybody should get a freaking vitamin D, B12, and omega-3 test. Like this, it pisses me off. <laughs> it pisses me off because it's funny because, because you know, we've been collecting, we have, we have a, a large number of individuals who've been going through our Optispan cohort. And, and the first time I sat down with the data for like 100 people, I'm looking at it and it jumps out at me that like 75% of people are deficient in D, B12, or omega-3. And a lot of people are deficient in all three. A, a majority. Yeah. I'm not joking. 75%. I mean, sure, we live in Seattle, but still. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so I go to a doctor friend of mine who's, who's, who I will not say his name to protect the guilty, but I go to him and I'm like, I just looked at our data. I can't believe it. 75% of people are deficient in one of these things. Like, I know. <laughs> what the fuck do you mean you know? You're a doctor. Fix it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah, we're, we're in Seattle. I mean, if, if that many people are omega-3 deficient, I mean, we probably eat more salmon than other. Yeah, other I think omega-3 is also a little bit tricky because what you define as deficient isn't as clear as it is with D and, and B12, right? So the omega, I'm pretty convinced by the, the omega-3 literature that um, in the United States, the vast majority of people are certainly under optimal, yeah. right? 
Um, I don't know where you draw the line for de deficient there. It's a little mm -hmm. bit hard, but certainly under optimal. And I, I have come to believe that, you know, shooting for an omega index of eight or higher is probably where you want to be. That's actually hard. I'm still not there. D define that explicitly oh, Omega for us. index is uh, EP, EP, EPA plus DHA, yeah, right? Yeah. There are a variety of ways you can measure, but that's the most common one. And there's a, there's a blood test, um, I think Quest, I think it's Quest has Omega Check, which will give you, both Quest and LabCorp have their versions. Maybe it's LabCorp that has Omega Check, but both of them will give you EPA and DHA. One of them will actually calculate Omega Index, but it's easy to calculate. Um, but you know, the epidemiology to me is pretty clear that there's at least a strong correlation for all of, for those three. I mean, those aren't the only three. Those are the ones though that I think people are deficient in and don't realize it. And in part because those things a lot of the vitamins and, and, and minerals that you can measure in blood will change really quickly, right? Yep. Could be because you took the supplement that morning, yep. right? Those things take a while to move the needle. So you actually get a pretty good measure of where people are at over the long term. Um, but the thing that pisses me off is it's so easy to fix. And we don't, most people don't ever get it measured. And, and I didn't get my vitamin D tested until I was 51. Like I probably was deficient for decades and mm -hmm. didn't even know it, right? So that's one thing that ev I think everybody should just get that test. It's, it's, it's such low hanging fruit. We, I mean, from a public health perspective, we should just offer that as part of the standard and standard, then yeah. give people the fricking supplements for free and, and, and quality control it. So everybody knows they're getting good quality supplements. Right, right. Like, this is something like, I, I get that people have different opinions on what government should do, but the payback from just making sure that so many people are not deficient in these things is so outweighs the cost of doing that, that this is like a no brainer. This is a public health thing that's easy. This is not low-hanging fruit. This is fruit that's on the ground fucking rotting, and we should <laughs> do something about it. So anyways, this is my, this is my tirade on, on nutritional deficiencies. But that's something, I think, I think hormones are another big one yeah. that most people don't ever get measured, or if they do, they only get their hormones measured when they start having symptoms. Yeah. This is a little bit different in men and women, because in women, we expect women to go through menopause around a certain age. And so we kind of know what to look for and we kind of know what to expect. I think a lot of men have hormonal changes that are impacting their quality of life, but they don't know it because right. you never get a hormone test. They were more gradual, yeah, crept up right. on them. Yeah. Right. And, and, you know, hormones are important for sexual function, of course, also important for metabolism, body right. composition, bone density, both women and men. And so that's, again, something that I think a lot of people could benefit from knowing where they're at. And again, I personally feel that hormone replacement therapy is right for a lot of people. And, and I talked about body composition. That's the other thing I would point to. Everybody should get a freaking DEXA in their 40s. And at least once every few years. What is that. DEXA? Oh, DEXA, dual x-ray absorptometry. So it's a uh, a low, it's, it's x-ray, but it's very low dose radiations. It's probably about the same as a flight from Seattle to California. So nothing to worry about if you do it once a year or every few years. So DEXA will give you uh, body fat composition, both total amount and positional lean mass composition, both total amount and positional and bone density, both total and positional. And so those things can be used, obviously bone density for fracture risk. If you're on the path to osteopene osteopenia, osteoporosis, catch it early. You can do things to slow down the decline or even improve it. Resistance training, for example, if you don't want to take drugs. Um, the other thing out of DEXA that I think most people don't appreciate, I mean, lean mass is obviously important. The other thing I think most people don't appreciate is not all fat is created equal. Right. So there's the, the subcutaneous fat, which, you know, if there's a good fat, that's the good fat. And then there's the visceral adipose, which is the fat around your organs underneath the abdominal wall. That's what people call the bad fat. That's the highly inflammatory fat that probably disproportionately contributes to metabolic disease. Yep. So again, you can actually be relatively lean, but have high visceral adipose and be at high risk for metabolic disease. You may not even know it, yep. right? So that's another one that I, I kind of feel like everybody should get. Then the last thing I'll mention um, that I personally have found very educational, and I know a lot of people who have, if it's done right, is continuous glucose monitoring. Mm. So these are these devices that traditionally have been used for diabetics, now becoming more popular. I think, in fact, FDA just approved an yeah. over-the-counter. I used one once. I'm not diabetic, but yeah. I just wanted to see. And yeah. right away, I learned things that were unexpected to me. I thought at the this time in my life, two or three years ago, I was eating a quote unquote healthy yeah, breakfast right? cereal yeah. that spiked my glucose yeah. like nothing else in my diet yeah. did. Yeah, and I want to, and again, this is why I say using it right. I think I think the the CGM is is can be very useful even for people who don't don't really um, 
have a structure to the program. But I think it was when it's done in a little bit more structured way yeah. with education around what it means, it's actually extremely sticky. What I mean by that is it's behavior modifying in a way that no other single tool I've seen is. People will, like you said, you realize this particular thing that I thought was healthy actually may not be. And you stop eating it. Yeah. Like, and it stays with you. You're not going to unlearn what you learn. The one thing I do think it's important to be careful about, though, is there is this sort of myth that has been put out there by some of these direct-to-consumer companies that every glucose spike is bad. And that's a myth. Mm -hmm. Like a glucose spike is a normal physiological response yep. to certain types of food. Yep. Um, so you should, you, I think the, the problem is sometimes people get scared into thinking that, that if it ever spikes, yeah, that, that's terrible. Yeah, yeah. And it's not. And, and, and so I think that can be counterproductive, but in, in any case, I think CGMs are really useful tools for helping people understand how their body functions. And you learn the sort of individual variations because the same the same diet right, right. may have different effects on glucose homeostasis in different people. The other reason why I think CGM is so powerful is we found in our program that, a, I don't know what the percentages are, but a significant number of people had undiagnosed prediabetes and diabetes, and yep. you find it right away if yep. you're doing a CGM. Yep. As opposed to not doing that, in which case you're only going to find out months or years later when you have yep. full-blown diabetes. Yeah, and I, and I would say, you know, uh, HbA1c is probably the that and fasting glucose are the two markers that you will get from a, a standard primary care blood panel that will cause a doctor to suggest that you might have diabetes. They're pretty good, mm -hmm. but they're not perfect. And especially fasting glucose is, is really um, very individual. There are some people who will have uh, low fasting glucose and terrible glucose homeostasis, and some people who will have a fasting glucose, you know, in the the low 100s, which would be considered prediabetes. But it's because if you wear a CGM, you'll see these people have what's called a strong dawn effect. So just right before they wake up, their glucose may come from 80s up to about 105, 110, and it'll stay there for a few hours, and then it'll come back down. Mm. So they've got perfectly good glucose homeostasis, but if you take a fasting glucose test, you're going to look like you have prediabetes. I see. So what do you guys do at Optispan? Yeah, so we, um, I would I would frame Optispan as a healthcare technology company primarily. Our goal is to build tools, technologies, protocols that will enable this type of proactive preventative healthcare for as many people as possible. That's like the big mission. We have some ideas on how we get there. So our initial approach is to do this in the clinical setting, and in a, I don't really like the phrase corporate wellness, but corporate health span setting. So create programs that we can scale and export to other providers that do this as well as possible given constraints on economics, right? So in the high-end concierge medical world, there really are no constraints. You can do everything. But then the question there is, what is optimal, right? What are, what is, what are the most effective tools that we can bring to bear if really money is no object. And then within something like a corporate wellness program or corporate health span program, what can we do at a price point that employers or maybe down the road insurers are willing to pay for that gets you 80%, 90% of the way there? So those are the things we're trying to figure out. So we have a clinical program up and running. We call it our trailblazer program. I am thrilled with what we've built. I think the experience from a clinical perspective is on par with the best of the best in the high-end concierge medicine world. I don't actually like the phrase longevity medicine because there are a lot of people who have co-opted that, who don't know anything about longevity. And then there are a lot of people who have co-opted it who are doing offshore kind of, you know, outside the lines stuff. So it's got some connotations that I don't like. We're trying to do it right as science and evidence-based as possible. Um, and then our corporate wellness program is pretty solid. So we do an expanded blood work panel that includes many of the things that that that, that I mentioned for all of the employees within our, our um, corporate client right now. We have one corporate client and uh, our clinical program has about 30 people in it right now. We're shooting for 100, you know, by the next 12 months, we'll probably exceed that. But, but all of that, it, those programs are to build the tools, the toolkit, right? So that's what we're working on now. We've got the we know what we want to measure. We know how to measure it. We're measuring it. We're acting on it. How do we build the toolkit that allows us to automate that as much as possible? Do you, well, let me ask you this. So there's a lot of experts and uh, self-proclaimed experts out there 
giving people a lot of information. Much of it is of questionable quality. Who are like one or two people out there, scientists, researchers, who have written books or have podcasts or whatever yeah. that you w would recommend people listen to? Yeah. So the, the two people I would point to who have, have written books um, – are Andrew Steele. I think his book is is really well written and also reflects the science in a very uh, uh, solid way, like rigorous way. And Peter Atia. And I mean, I know Peter. Peter's. It's funny because he's a little bit controversial in some circles, and I don't understand why. Because oftentimes the controversy is because people sort of misrepresent, in my opinion, at least what he says. Like you know, in any case, Peter's a friend of mine, so maybe I'm biased in that way. But I also think he's very thoughtful about the science, and he really does try to take a rational risk-reward approach. He's very serious. Um, and so I, if I had to pick like one person who I would take advice from, it'd be Peter. Um, and again, we don't agree on everything, but I, 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 I respect his approach. Um, uh, having said that, outside of that, you know, I honestly tend not to spend a lot of time um, paying attention to most of the other people out there. Um, not because there aren't other good people out there, but but because I don't have the bandwidth <laughs> yeah, to do yeah. it. And I also feel like I think the rule of thumb I would take is um, be wary of people who speak with certainty on, you know, broad topics. Yeah. And I mean, I, I think this is what gets Peter in trouble a little bit at times with, you know, some of the, some of the criticism he takes is he speaks with certainty sometimes when I don't think he really believes that he has certainty, but mm -hmm. most of the time he's pretty balanced and, and says when it's a, a, you know, a, 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 a plausible or this is what I think, but you know, the people who speak with certainty in, in this space, I think are usually uninformed. So their certainty actually comes from a lack of understanding of the complexity of this you know, system that we call the human body, yep. right? I think most people who learn enough realize that it's so complex that we really need to be humble about what we understand and what we don't understand. So I tend to, when somebody says everybody should do X outside of a few things, I tend to shut them off at that point. I'm like, you know, if you're going to get that wrong, you're probably going to get a lot of other stuff wrong. Well, Matt, this was uh, fascinating. Thank you for inviting me here. Uh, I live in yeah, Seattle. I'm glad so, you could uh, make yeah. it out to OpSpan HQ today. Yeah, yeah. And I, I would look forward to uh, looking around a little bit and, and see what you guys are up to. But um, is there are there any final thoughts you want to leave people with or anything you want to reiterate that we went over today? I think the one thought that I would just reiterate is, and I sort of alluded to this with the NIH funding, um, you know, I think most people don't immediately appreciate that if you look at most of the major causes of of loss of quality of life, death, disability in the United States and other developed countries. If you look at the top 10 killers, nine of them have age as their greatest risk factor. And I would say biological age as their greatest risk factor. So again, our entire approach to health for the last 200 years has been, at least in Western countries, has been focused around disease, right? We Think of diseases in isolation. We usually wait until people are sick. We try to cure their disease. And that's, that sort of approach from the medical side has filtered all the way back to basic research. Most basic research is done on individual diseases. Most drug development is done to cure diseases. Most medical practice is done to treat disease symptoms, right? I think we need a paradigm shift. And, I, and this is where Peter Atia and I align you know, very strongly. We need a paradigm shift in all of those, not just in healthcare, but all the way through that spectrum from basic research on up to focus on what can we do to keep people healthy instead of keeping people sick. And I think there's a lot that we can do outside of the biology of aging, right? Some of these things like fixing common vitamin deficiencies or you know catching things early. But I think the biology of aging needs to play an important role and will play a more important role as we understand that biology better and are better able to, to intervene in it. So as part of that, I think raising awareness of this idea that, you know, what we have, the, the situation we find ourselves in today in terms of healthcare largely stems from that reactive disease approach. And that's been pretty effective. Like a lot of people's cancers have been cured, but it's also created a lot of problems. We've got a lot of people who are living 40, 30, 20 years with chronic disease, that's really expensive. That is not the best way to keep people alive. And so we really, I think, 
unless we're going to have a catastrophic failure of our healthcare system, need to do this, make this paradigm shift happen. And so the more people who recognize that, hopefully the faster we can kind of change the system in a way that is, that is going to be more focused on health and less focused on disease. And I do want to mention that I think this needs to happen in addition to, you know, basic research, pharmaceutical, medical professionals at the policy level as well. I think we need to have policymakers in the United States understand this perspective and start to take action on um, changing the system from a policy level. And fortunately, we're starting to see that. So um, it turns out there's actually just last year, uh, something called the Longevity Science Caucus in the U.S. House of Representatives. It's still pretty small, but it's a start. And so if we can start to have our elected representatives pay attention and take action on this, we can start to create incentive structures from the top down, maybe, that will help with this shift. So just want to put that out there. And, and I think the more people who kind of understand that, that 